perfect. Um, was also highly relevant to autism rounds. So if some of you were at the Autism Research Day um, family research conference, um, this is the same presentation. So I would not take any offense if you, if you wanted to go, of course. Um, and so this study, I'm just gonna do a quick presentation on um, a qualitative study that was actually done, well, again, it was started was started pre-COVID, but I think it was COVID by the time we got into data collection. Um, and it was the idea of Marcella, who was a developmental pediatric so specialty fellow um, from Costa Rica, who was up here doing her fellowship for a couple of years. And um, I was her research advisor for the study. Um, and so it was really her idea and where it came from was that she was doing all these clinics with families and realized that many, many, many of the families with whom she was working had one child who was diagnosed with a developmental disability um, or was querying, coming in for assessment, um, but that in many, many of the families, there were multiple children. And so she wondered, is there something unique about that experience? And we developed this relatively small scale qualitative study um, and then Marcella went back to Costa Rica and we still wanted to collect more data. And so I was able to engage three of my MSCOT students who do a capstone project every year. And so we went through training on qualitative interviews um, and analysis, and then they were each able to do some of the interviews. Um, we did them over Zoom and then um, coll collectively, of course, we did the data analysis. So um, we do know that um, developmental disabilities, broadly speaking, are actually, they're quite common. Um, and so about one in six children is sort of where the stats lie in Canada. And then the odds of experiencing disability are further increased if there is a sibling who also experiences disability. The research suggests a lot of burden and negative outcomes related to this experience. Um, things like mental health strain, decreased well-being, things like anxiety, stress. Um, and of course, there are stressors. We by no means, um, of, of course, we acknowledge that. But there's also a bias in research that we as researchers, and me in the past too, um, really tend to focus on negative outcomes. So for this study, we really tried to shift the negative narrative for parenting research and acknowledge challenges, but really try to focus on positive experiences. So our aim was to explore those unique experiences of parenting multiple children with disability, um, how it influences parent well-being and social participation. Um, and again, by trying to explore some of those positive experiences. So again, this was a qualitative study. Um, the method is interpretive qualitative description. And that method is really commonly used to guide research with the potential to inform clinical practice. So it seemed like a good match for, for this type of work. Um, we feel that the pivot to Zoom interviews was actually really a positive because that we then recruited across Alberta. And um, we thought that was important because we, Otherwise, no offense to the Glamrose, but otherwise all families in the Edmonton area predominantly would have their interactions with one site. And so this really allowed us to sort of open up across the province. Um, we did have inclusion criteria of living in Canada for at least one year. And we did that because should a family just move here, um, there's just a lot else going on within that first year that we felt might not really speak to those experiences of parenting children to experience disability. Um, they had to be able to participate in an English language interview because that's the only language that we all spoke. Um, and then we included children two to 12 years and that the diagnosis was at least two years before. And that's based on some of the literature of that, that, um, that sort of time of of understanding, accepting, and um, getting into routine post-diagnosis. 
and then to be a primary caregiver for at least two years. Um, we did have some foster parents in our studies, so um, the majority were not, but, but we did have some. And these were just some of our example questions. So tell me about your children. What are some of their strengths? What was your knowledge of developmental disability before they were diagnosed? How would you describe your parenting experiences raising multiple children? What's been different with the second or more child? Um, and how's it influenced your participation in your community or social recreational activities? Um, I will say when we started this, Marcella came with about 10 research projects and um, just really wanted to understand so, so much. And so we did narrow it down to that well-being and social participation piece um, based on sort of what, what really, um, what she was most excited to explore. So these are our participants um, and I'm looking at the names and I don't think there's any parent. I had wondered if maybe some parents who participated might attend some of the presentations. Um, these are all pseudonyms. So we had 10 participants, they were all mothers. We did not recruit mothers, but as is typical of much research, um, our participants were all mothers. Each mother had two to six children who were diagnosed with a developmental disability and those diagnoses varied. Um, and consistent with, with literature, most children did have multiple co-occurring diagnoses, but autism and ADHD were by far the most common diagnoses. Some of our other diagnoses were learning disability, Tourette syndrome, OCD, anxiety, visual impairment, dyslexia, FASD, and the children ranged in age from two to 23. So some families had two or more in that 12 years and under, and also older children. Um, and so of course they they spoke to their broader experiences. Um, and about half lived in Edmonton or Calgary um, and then half lived in smaller centers um, or more rural or rural remote locations. Um, they were all partnered. So married, common law, remarried, they were all living in a home with a partner. And the mother's ages ranged from 35 to 52 and the average was 42. Um, so there were a total of 33 children in the families, 30 had one or more developmental disability diagnoses, and 23 identified as male. So that sort of is our sample overall. Um, and so three of those families had children who, to their knowledge, did not experience disability, and then seven, um, all of their children were diagnosed with some sort of, of developmental disability. Sometimes the same as their peers, sometimes not. So each family of course had unique experiences, but there were a lot of consistent experiences. So we went through an iterative process of analysis. Um, we all read all the interviews, then we individually coded a couple interviews. We met frequently as a group. We had at least two people code each interview. Um, and so after reading and coding interviews, we had five meetings together as a group before we landed on themes that we really felt accurately represented the data. Um, you'll notice overlapping circles here. That's because there's overlap in how some of the data fits into multiple themes. Um, but we noted three themes, which are the bigger font. So disconnection and engagement with others, knowledge is power and shifts in self-care, and then sub-themes within those. And we'll go through each theme in more depth. So our first theme depicts the mother's journey of feeling more knowledgeable with each subsequent child with a developmental disability. And they describe the power of disability knowledge, of the associated skill sets, and of embracing their advocacy roles and how these had a cumulative effect with each subsequent child. So related to increased disability knowledge, they talked about, all of our mothers talked about knowing very little about disability prior to the diagnosis of their first child, and then an exponential growth following that first diagnosis. They learned to adapt quickly, they educated themselves through any means available, which was very much online um, given the pandemic that occurred during this study. With subsequent children, they felt they knew better where to look for information and to look for good information, 
to recognize signs of potential differences much earlier. They trusted their gut feelings more and knowledge gained empowered them to be proactive at accessing diagnoses, resources, supports, and funding. And then with these feelings of empowerment, the initial feelings of guilt and anxiety that many of our mothers talked about surrounding that first child's diagnosis shifted to feelings of confidence and acceptance. Um, so one quote from that theme was with Jack, my first child, I carried a lot of guilt where I didn't necessarily feel that guilt as much with William. There was more acceptance, I guess, and more recognition that the diagnosis was more a doorway to get you the help that your child would need as opposed to like a sentence on your child or a stigma on your child or you as a parent. Uh, mothers also embrace their advocacy roles. So the result of having more than one child, they felt empowered to take on a role of an advocate for their children. Um, it spanned beyond disability to knowledge of obtaining diagnosis and accessing supports and resources. They took it on as a necessity for parents. And we know that from our other work that it's kind of like a full-time job for parents to navigate all these things. Um, and that they took, they took pride or really felt that they could recognize their child's needs before others and to gain supports based on those previous experience and that they took a lot of comfort in that. Um, so with the diagnosis of my second child, I felt I had the ticket to all I need to help her. And Hannah said, you feel less stressed about it, more aware of what's available. I already knew about SLP early intervention. I had firsthand experience as a parent accessing all those things. So when he came and I was like, oh, he's behind, I knew. I was already seeing the early intervention worker and was just like, hey, can you add him to your list? So really enhancing their awareness and understanding and taking on that role of advocate was described as a positive outcome um, of having multiple children diagnosed with developmental disability. It helped them to view their children's differences more positively. It helped them to decrease, or they felt, to decrease stigma they faced and it helped them to perceive and highlight their children's strengths. Um, then the next theme depicted a shift in self-care of mother's well-being based on those unique experiences. And we did always try and come back to the unique experiences of multiple children and not parenting um, in general. And although we tried to really focus on positive, these experiences did represent both negative and positive outcomes perceived by the mothers, um, really related to how it shifted their perspective over time, leading to feelings of empowerment, empathy, and purpose, also acknowledging challenges in daily life and participation. So shifts in emotional well-being and self-care. So all participants noted a decreased ability to participate in self-care activities. And although this is expected of parenting in general, beyond what was expected of parenting in general or parenting one child who experiences disability. Um, they talked about their children having different abilities and challenges than each other, making it sort of an extra level of challenge of supporting multiple children and meeting those unique needs. Um, they talked about how having access and availability to appropriate childcare respite services was a real contributor to parent well-being and the ability to practice their own self-care. But then of course, as many of us know, there were lots of barriers to respite. Um, and so that really influenced parents' well-being because of a lack of support and time. Um, feelings of exhaustion and isolation were common. And again, parents felt that this was above and beyond parenting in general. Um, they talked about even if they were able to receive respite, it didn't necessarily translate to increased self-care because they used that time just to complete household tasks and chores. And again, I'm sure that this is not surprising to those of us who have this lived experience or work in the field. Um, to go out with many children, parents talked about how that was difficult because of their children's different abilities and different needs. They talked about things like um, sensitivities to crowds and, and noises and how they would often have to sort of divide and conquer. Um, and that that sort of inaccessibility was exhausting for those families and that that lack of understanding led to increased isolation. So Ava says, I'm just burnt out. I'm tired. I haven't slept in like four years. Isa said they go swimming with respite so I can get stuff done or they'll take them sledding so I can get stuff done. That's not respite. 
Um, and so although parent well-being was immensely impacted, and we of course have to appreciate and acknowledge it, um, participants also talked about feelings of empowerment, purpose, and empathy. They, a lot of participants left their place of employment to focus on parenting full time. And then they often found hobbies, activities, or volunteer opportunities within disability organizations because they felt empowered and they felt like it really gave them a sense of purpose. So for example, Beth shared how she now volunteers for other groups working with people with disabilities. Um, Hannah says, I think it's really helping us grow as people, learning how to be more patient and understanding of people with differences. Ashley says, I feel totally more understanding and thoughtful and compassionate person than I once was. So overall, our participants unanimously said that they felt like their experience parenting multiple children with disability made them a better person. And then our last theme acknowledges the struggles of work and instrumental activities of daily living and social and community participation. And yet amidst these feelings of isolation and exhaustion, participants did remain positive and ultimately concluded that being a parent of multiple children enhanced many aspects of their lives, including family connection, sense of meaning and purpose. And so with community and social participation, Many parents talked about how everyday tasks, things like going to the grocery store, became more difficult. Um, that again, they would have to navigate children with sort of different needs in community um, environments. Many parents talked about how their own social lives were changed um, since having their children. So it could be hard to get out because of a lack of um, competent and trusted babysitters or respite care, or because parents, um, other parents didn't understand their experience. And so they just weren't welcome or didn't feel, didn't feel welcome. Um, however, they, a lot of our parents talked about deep, meaningful social connection through relationships within their own family. So a deepened sense of family engagement or through the disability community. So for example, Leah said, they all enjoy it, but Jacob does not for very long and no one could keep going, but he's happy being overstimulated. But Jacob, now he, I think we're about halfway through the time there and he wanted to go home. And I think that was maybe, I'm trying to remember, it might've been about going to a public swimming pool. So one child wanted to stay all day and one child, you know, just didn't tolerate it for very long. Um, Ashley talked about some of the social isolation. So we don't receive invitations to be honest. What I personally really feel is a lack of being invited to be in a village. We feel lonely. Um, and Ava said, it's hard to have friends with people who don't have kids with high needs to have friends at all. But then with family relationships, all the mothers talked about how those relationships changed. And many of them, even though there were stressors, did talk about a positive impact on those relationships. So Beth said, there's that kind of us bonding too like strategizing. And I love it when we're interacting, they just accept each other or when they are interacting. And she was talking about her, her children, both of whom experienced developmental disability. And Leah said, in some ways, he understands his brother more than a typical or a neurotypical brother would. Um, and so parents also talked about influencing the spousal relationship. Um, and challenging, but strengthening in some ways, and also that, that unique bond between, between their children. The positive family moments made parents really grateful, despite the challenges um, in that bond. And so when we were, as a team, we were really trying to think about, okay, what does this mean? There's a lot here that we knew, um, but there's a lot of positive and strengths that parents talked about. Um, and so reflecting back on the motivation for the study, so Marcella is a healthcare provider um, who was really motivated by families coming in. Um, and so thinking about how we would optimize support, and I know that there's lots of clinicians um, on this call. So just to acknowledge challenges, of course, um, also know that parents, for a lot of parents, life is really different, but not worse. Um, so for us to be advocates for support, especially things that might offer opportunity for increased self-care and for connection, um, to draw on strengths of families, to consider connections to the disability community um, and opportunities for meaningful relationships. And of course, this is a 
parent choice. You know, you don't have to get involved. But our parents really did speak positively about their engagement with the disability community, about parent-to-parent -parent expertise and advocacy. Um, it was a community that none of these parents really expected to be part of before they had children, but that they really appreciated um, once they had those opportunities and that they found them really rich opportunities. <laughs>